And I think live. Hello. Good evening and welcome to quote Sydney. Um, I have got a slightly different uh, screen set up. I've changed my computer and I haven't done this for a long time and it all looks a bit different, but never mind. Um, I've got my bloody miniatures here. They arrived in the post yesterday. Let's get rid of that keyboard. I'm not really typing you a love letter. Um, just a dab of rouge on the cheeks, Pete, um, asking me about my experiences in makeup. Um, yeah, so some more bloody miniatures have arrived. Um, these look lovely. And Pikeman, friends of General Hague. Hello, friends of General Hague. Ahoy, good evening. Good evening to you. We've got a question from you coming up a little bit later. Nice to see. It isn't bloody miniatures release eight. But it is a sort of variation on that. We've got some pikes, but I bought a bit more than... Oh, I, I did a variation on the theme. And I wanted some more shot. Uh, Joe Bilton in uh, Watford, Watford, he said, am I getting them done for Hearts of Lard? And I am. Uh, Dave Brown, Housewife's favourite. Is it the real Dave Brown or is it the imposter Dave Brown? Uh, how do housewives feel about you, Dave? I think you might be the imposter, Dave, might not you? Right. Um, nice thumbs up from Watford. Uh, Greg in South Africa. What part of South Africa are you in, Greg? Um, beautiful country. Or it was the last time I was there, which is a long, long time ago. Um, right. So I'm going to be getting these together. Yeah, getting these done for um, In the Buff, which... We're really cracking on with playtests, even from Stockport. Not quite as glamorous as the uh, as Kruger National Park, but uh, nevertheless, equally welcome here. Bloemfontein in the Orange Free State. Lovely. I've never been there, actually. Uh, or, or, no, I don't think I went to rugby there. Um, right. Okay. Well, I've got a whole list of questions. Feel free to add them in. I'm not painting and chatting. I'm preparing figures because if I paint, I need a different set of glasses uh, and I can't read your questions. So I'm just doing this. Good evening from Tucson in Arizona for some California grass, as a wise man once said. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, prep these. And I, <laughs> the great thing about bloody miniatures is there's so little flash on them. Hello, Rosario. I know you're in the UK because we corresponded the other day um uh there's so little flash on them they almost need no preparation so in five minutes time i'll probably be finished although i do need to add some uh pikes to some of these guys which look great it's arrived good to hear that rosaria great to hear that it's uh that what normally happens is when people email me to say um uh, uh my rules haven't arrived. They normally arrive about 10 minutes later. But so, so good to hear yours have arrived there. Um, Transit Shrek, Pete, good morning and evening in New Zealand. Hi, Pete. Nice to uh, nice to hear from you there. What part are you in? North Island, South Island? I've got family in both, um, predominantly from Dunedin, actually, uh, down on the South Island. But a lot of them have emigrated up to the North Island. You're in Wellington, right beautiful part of the world my younger daughter was out there a couple of well just before lockdown actually she was in new zealand she left the day before you all locked down um but uh, lovely country my elder daughter's going across to queenstown this um not summer next spring for you guys down there hello gregory in melbourne nice to hear from you uh greg i'm looking forward to seeing you guys at CanCon in January, I've actually booked my tickets. I've booked my accommodation in Sydney. I just need to book my internal flights. Dice Dad, hi, Andy, up in Cheshire. Nice to hear from you. Leafy Cheshire, mate. Leafy Cheshire. Um, uh, he says, congratulations on getting General Darmay over the line. Thank you. Um, it's When we release a set of rules, it is exhausting, and it is really, really hard work. But um, – uh, it, it's it's great. Once it gets done, we actually got the um, got the second print run in on 
whatever day this week one day this week we got we got another huge amount of them which um which obviously is indicative of the fact that we nearly completely sold out of the of the first print run we didn't even have enough stock to uh pass on to the traders but we've done that now i was up in nottingham uh this week getting that done so that's really good um We've got a list of questions people have uh, sent in, had some by email, had some on Twitter, had some on Facebook. And so if you don't mind, what I'll do is I'll start off with some of those. Feel free to um, post any supplementary questions you might have or tell me I'm an idiot or do whatever you want. But um, um, uh, we've got 40 people on board. Nice to, nice to, um, nice to see you all. That's great. Uh, we Derek in Scotland, Derek Hodge. Um, Great friend who runs uh, deep fried lard up there in Musselboro every year asked me why do you always run these events on a Thursday, which is their club night up in Musselboro. Um, uh, <laughs> it's not intentional, Derek. I do apologise. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I shall have to try and do it on a different day. But it's um, kind of um, Monday night. I tend to head out for a beer. Monday is my. I tend to work most weekends, so Monday is my sort of weekend and tuesday night we've got our club and friday night i really don't want to be doing um uh bloody miniature pikes friends of general hey yes um friday night i really don't want to be boring you te to tears when you should be out having fun or doing whatever so um it's really either fred worthingham from the north um uh not um uh, not quite as far north as Norway, but I'm sure you've got a big bucket of heavy water with you there, Charlie. And um, uh, good to see you doing um, some re-rigging, re was it? For Kiss Me Hardy too, which we can talk about. Hello, Robert, from Reading. Or are you reading? <laughs> I presume you're in Reading. Um, right, what a foolish thing to say. Um, Jim. One of the things I love about hearing from our friends in the United States of America is I can't pronounce your surnames. Um, so Italy or France on a Saturday? Ooh, don't know. France, I think. Right. Uh, Jim Obzarski in Milwaukee, which was where Happy Days was set, I think, wasn't it? Arthur Fonzarelli. Tom Egan. Hello, Tom. Nice to see you back. On the Emerald Isle, after a year over deployed with the United Nations um, on the Golan Heights, exciting stuff. So good to see you home, mate, and uh, and uh, doing your communist stuff there, which is great. Right, good evening. Um, uh, hello, Ian Fraser. Good evening to you. Uh, lovely to hear you say about GDA two being excellent. We work hard to try and get it. Great to be back, says Tom Egan. Wasn't that Gary Glitter? Hopefully not. Um, uh, great to hear you say that GDO2 is excellent. Thank you. Um, I think Dave has done a fabulous job, and uh, I like to think that um, we did it justice in terms of uh, the looks and layout and this, that, and the other. Um, uh, Jim in Milwaukee says, Monday, Tuesday, uh, KMH2, question mark. And the answer is yes. In fact, Charlie, with his heavy water up there in the, the Norwegian fjords, is um, actually working on uh, KMH2. Um, and it's brilliant to see the work that he's doing with that. I had a really good fun game of it. Um, uh, uh, a while ago. Uh, but so it would be nice to get together again and have a have a, a look and see where he's taken that. But that is really looking good fun. Uh, it's been a great fun game. Elk Joe. Hi, Elk Joe in uh, the Netherlands, artist formerly known as Holland, says, Hi, Richard. Will there ever be an update on Cox España? See you next month. Indeed, I'm heading over to Arn Arnhem uh, for the Cloglard event, which has got a clever name in Dutch, which is really funny and based on a television advert about lard, but I can't say that. September, says says Charlie. Um, uh, I presume he's talking about KMH2, um, but uh, we will have to see what, what Jibber Jabber is coming out with. Uh, yes, so KMH2 is on the way. Secondly, is there any further development for I'm in shop plan? 
Uh, Phil Dents also asked that. Actually, I'm in shop, Mum. Have you ever thought of updating this system? Uh, no, I haven't really. And no, I haven't got any plans to do anything with it. Um, never mind. Um, interesting one here from Julio Inglésias, which I presume is not the Julio Inglésias, uh, but he, he asked... <coughs> Oh, September was when I saw the playtest, when I played the playtest version of KMH2. Right, it's good good to see that you have got a memory, Charlie. Um, obviously, you like to keep lists and uh, write down all those names. Um, but, uh, right, so that was when I played. Brilliant, excellent. Well, it was really, really jolly fun. Uh, and um, I, I, hopefully I'll get an opportunity to see where that has gone at some time in the very near future, because it would be great to see KMH2 come out, because I think there's a... Um, the first edition, obviously, we've had great fun with, but it's been around for a long, long time now, over 20 years. So uh, I think it's time for... Um, uh, uh, time for a second edition. And Joe Bilton says, Charlie, was it KMH2 at Brickholm? or Vidkun, as we like to call him. Um, yes, it was. Uh, not Brickcon. It was at Hammerhead, wasn't it? I don't know whether it was Brickcon. Who knows? What do I know? Anyway, stick to your questions, Clarky. So, Hulo Inglesias. Fabulous name. We had an order the other day from Jesus Christ, which um, surprised me. Um, Hulo, especially after my comments about the Pope uh, on Twitter, Hulo Inglesias says, how has the launch of GDA2 gone? And actually, it's been brilliant. Um, and, uh, I did touch on this a moment ago. We, we're already on the, the second print run, which is um, which is uh, great. Obviously, great. Um, all the profits have gone into printing the second edition. So, from that point of view, if I had guesstimated better uh, in terms of how many I had printed. I could have done quite well out of it, as it is all the profit has gone back to reprint it, which in a way is kind of the worst case situation with any rule set. But uh, there we go. Say la vie, say la vie, in the words of, I can't remember who said that. Um, uh, right, great businessman. Yeah, Joe, as you know, mate, you know, it's, a, <laughs> it's not necessarily my, the business side of things is not necessarily my fault. The issue was, to be honest with you, we've got limited stock room. Um, we've got limited stock space. We, we have a stock unit, but there is a limit to how much you can put in it. You know, if you get 1,500 copies of a set of rules printed, it's about the size of a mini. Um, and if you get a thousand sets of rules printed, it's not uh, much smaller than a mini. So it takes up a lot of space. And so consequently, some of the decisions that we make have to be based on um, literally on square feet. Um, so uh, but it's gone really well. And the nice thing about it is, is that it's um, it appears to have been really well received. I think that what Dave has done uh has been really to um, to think outside the box and to streamline the game, uh, so it's um, uh, easier easier to pick up and, and run with, which is absolutely great. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Rob Goodfellow says, do you have any idea when Midgard will be available? That's a very interesting question, particularly as. Uh, we had a meeting today. Uh, I had a meeting with James today, and I had a meeting uh, with the um, design studio yesterday, um, and they have sent us through the first mock-up of the sample chapter. So the way they're doing it is obviously rather than lay out the whole thing and me say, oh, I don't like that, they've, they've done a, um, a chapter in the rules. It's about nine pages, which t shows us what the, the look is, what the overall theme is. And James and I had a meeting today to discuss that. We love it. We're really, 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 really pleased with the overall design. Obviously, like all these things, um, it's um, uh, a case of going back to them saying, yeah, we love that, but can we slightly change this? Or can we look at that? Or how about we do this differently? But that's really, really coming on. And like everything in life, the first chapter is the hardest one. Once you've got the first chapter uh, laid out and done, you've got the theme. You know what it's going to look like, and then hopefully it's a bit like um, 
shelling peas. Although uh, we we we've never worked with a design studio before. James had, but I haven't. So um, uh, how long things take, I'm not sure. But uh, it's progressing and going in the right direction. Hex Tabletop said, "Good evening. Are you going to be attending this year's salute?" I was going to say hello last year, but was too starstruck and bottled it. I have to say, the idea of anybody being starstruck about talking to me is quite laughable. Um, but yeah, yeah, I will be there um, and do come along and say hello. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm kind of in a floating role. Um, uh, Emma's going to be running the trade stand, but. Um, we're not sure how busy we're going to be. Last year when we went there, we had just released um, What a Cowboy, and it was absolutely crazy mental. Um, I was hoping to be releasing the Far East Handbook there, um, but we're not going to be because the printer is going away on holiday to America, and he's not back till about the 5th. Uh, and by that point, we're not going to have the... Um, we're not going to have the time to get it printed uh, in time for that, but it is going to be uh, fairly shortly afterwards. Um, Jimmy James uh, says, is Dutch Britannia and pretty much developed as far as it's going to go, or is there a plan or even a vague plan to return to it at some point? Um, and the answer is, cheerio, Joe Bilton. He's got to be off early. He needs his beauty sleep. In fact, he needs a lot of it, to be honest with you, Joe. Um, don't look at that mirror. Um, but, uh, yeah, good evening to you, mate. Nice to see you anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I'd like to do a third part of Dutch Britanniarum. Get it, right? <laughs> um, I, I'd like to do a third part of Dutch Britanniarum covering the Heptarchy, which I think is a really, really interesting period, and all Dane law and all that stuff. Um, and that would really just take it forward uh, to the point which I think is probably as far as it wants to go. The problem is hours in the day, days in the week, weeks in the year. Um, who knows? Who knows? It would be it, it's something I would like to do. Let's let's say that. Um, Michael uh, Obsonik in the United States of America said, "What force lists will be included in the chain of command Far East supplement? And if they're not in it?" Are the U.S. Marine Corps and other U.S. forces in the Pacific on the docket? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all, I mean, we've got a huge amount of U.S. forces, but they're going to be in the um, Pacific handbook, not the Far East handbook. We just got to the point where we realized it was so ridiculously uh, large. It was over 250 pages. I mean, that does create some issues. Um, because some of the stuff is going to be a bit of duplication in terms of the rules. Um, but what's in there? I've got I've got the document open. Actually, I've been working on it today. I've also been working on these. So I've been painting some Gurkhas for nice you know, little figures to drop in uh, as as images, and uh, one's a catch in scout as well. So what have we got? What have we got? Let's have a look on the list. Well, for the British. We've got a British infantry platoon from 1941-42, so that's Malaya, early Burma, Singapore. We've got a British garrison platoon at the same time, which um, have probably been um, uh, in the in the colonies for far too long and are not really uh, up on form. Uh, particularly the garrison at Hong Kong springs to mind there. Um, but that also represents some of the um, the poorer units in, uh, in in the Far East. We've got the Indian Army platoon, nineteen forty one to forty two, again covering a very very similar area. We've got the Indian Milked platoon, where the platoon has been um, milked to provide troops for other units. Um, so they really are quite poor. Um, you, you saw a lot of issues with um, the uh, Indian troops. Um, having morale issues in the early days. And often that was the fact that the battalions had been stripped of men to form the nucleus of other battalions. And that had happened several times. And so the, the replacement officers they had coming in didn't speak the language of the men, which made terrible issues with command and control. And also the men were ill-equipped, badly trained. That's the type of unit that we're looking at there. We've got an Australian rifle platoon, which is going to be covering the Australian troops in Malaya and Singapore. We've got Black Force on Java, which is 
uh, the force led by Arthur Blackburn, VC, um, who has a real interesting mix of sort of pioneers, ragtag mix of machine gunners and second line infantrymen and fought there on Java alongside the Dutch. Uh, so that's quite an interesting force. We've got a Canadian infantry platoon at Hong Kong. We've got the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps. We've got the Malay Regiment in Malaysia, obviously. We've got the Burma Rifles in Burma. We've got the Volunteer Defence Corps. That's people such as the Straits Settlement Volunteer Force, the Burma Auxiliary Force, the Burma Frontier Force, all sorts of uh, volunteers in the very early war then. Then we're heading on to the sort of middle war period of the Arakan, where you've got the Indian Army Platoon, the British Army Platoon, and then we're heading into things like the Commando Platoons, um, well, you've got a famous war gamer who's deployed out there in um, uh, in the form of um, Arab Legion. What was his name? Um, I can't, he founded the Sealed Knot. Somebody remind me. I can't be bothered. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was out there with the commandos and they uh, did amphibious landings in the Arakan. Uh, we've got Chindits in 1943. We've got the Burma Rifles Platoon in 1943. They're serving as guides to the Chindits. We've got British Infantry in 1944 to 45, Indian Army, 1944 to 55, Indian Motor Rifles. Really interesting unit there. The 4th Battalion of the Bombay Grenadiers were specifically singled out to provide close support for the armoured brigades, and the way they did it in the Indian Army's armoured brigades is they just provided one company per brigade, and they were there as a close support force. So um, they, they were unusual. They had four uh, uh, four companies um, in the battalion to allow them to do to do to cover off the four uh, brigades. Uh, we've got the Indian Para Indian Army parachute platoon. We've got the tribal levies. Now that are basically troops like the Nagas, the Kachin, uh, the Chin, the uh, Kamhau, the Lahu, um, and obviously they they played a significant part in the harassing of Japanese forces post Kohima and Imphal. We've got an African infantry platoon from 1944 to 45. African infantry can also be serving in the in the in the Chindits. Um, West African forces in the Chindits there who did um, uh, did very well. Um, which is great. Um, and uh, we have got the Assam Rifles, who effectively are a paramilitary force to protect the tea estates, but they turned up and uh, did very well in the fighting, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> fighting on India's borders and also working with V Force, who are the information gathering forces. Anyway, we've got Chindits in 44, we've got the Chindit Reconnaissance Platoon. We've got Army Commando sections in 44 and 45. We've got Royal Marine Commandos. We've even got an RAF regiment defending the airfields, especially around Mectila, where they fought some of their very first uh, actions. And then we've got the armoured support. So that's a colossal amount of lists for the British. Then we go into the Dutch East Indies. We've got the KNIL Field Force Platoon, which are the, the active mobile troops. Then we've got the Garrison Platoons. We've got the Maro Chaussee Platoon, which are para paramilitary police with lovely little swords. We've got KNIL Cavalry. We've got Cavalry Reconnaissance Troop. We've got Marine Troop. Marine's a slight misnomer because it was basically made out of anybody who'd ever seen a boat. Um, and uh, all got their socks wet. So it was uh, Brigadier Peter Young, somebody said, absolutely right. Um, what else have we got? Japanese, I really think so. Um, Japanese infantry, early war, 41-42. Cavalry reconnaissance platoon, motorized reconnaissance platoon, special naval landing party. They don't see a lot of action in the Far East, but they do get involved in the Dutch East Indies. We've got the Army Parachute Platoon, who also get involved in the Dutch East Indies, jumping in to um, uh, take on the airfield and all refinery around Palembang um, on Sumatra. Uh, we've got the uh, SNLF Parachute Platoon. So not only have we got uh, Army Parachute, we've got Navy Parachute. We've got an infantry platoon in 43. We've got an infantry platoon in 44 and 45. We've got a commando platoon. Um, we've got Japanese line of communications platoons, um, who are the guys who are really facing the Chindits a lot of the time, so not brilliant opposition. When we've got the Indian National Army platoon, 
who um, make an appearance there. You can use them. Any Japanese force fighting could use them as um, uh, a support option whereby they can uh, uh, take on board a Badahur group who attempt to undermine the morale of uh, the British troops. So, yeah, loads and loads. We're up to over 50 lists now in the Far East Handbook. Um, Paul Hobson said, when's it out? Well, it is out um, uh, April. Um, to be to be honest, and I have said this before, I'm just waiting for the end of the financial year. This the end, Our financial year ends on the last day in March. There's absolutely no point in um, putting anything up for advanced order now and uh, taking the money and then paying taxes on it immediately because basically we rely on working capital to fund projects. So if I take that money in April rather than March, I keep hold of it for an extra year. That allows us to fund other projects rather than just giving the tax straight back to the taxman. So it's um, um, there are fiscal reasons for it. Um, and I'm still um, finishing off with just some of the painting. It's pretty much all done. It's being proofread at the moment. So and I haven't I've got to proof. I've got to talk to the proofreader and got to sit down and have a conversation about that. Leslie um, of La Belle France, who I believe is uh, in Wales at the moment, he says, good evening, Rich. How's your health these days? Absolutely all right. Uh, I had another scan result through yesterday saying there's nothing wrong with you, Clarkie, and I haven't fallen downstairs and cracked my head open again, so I'm kind of good. So um, uh, I went out and um, had about 12 pints last night just to uh, celebrate. So that's really good. You're in Normandy. Are you right? Okay. Uh, I, I know you were in Normandy, but I thought for some reason you moved to Wales for, on holiday or something. So bonjour, as you would say in Normandy. So that's brilliant. Yeah, so really good. Thank you. Um, that's a bloody good set of lists. It is, actually. We, we've got some really, really nice images in there. We've been working with Studio Historia, who do some – fabulous 3d printed figures and they've supplied supplied us with some great images also working with with christian at painting panzers in perth and there's a tongue twister in there he paints panzers in perth on the seashore um so uh absolutely superb uh painting of his 20 mil stuff which is far better than my 28 mil stuff so um yeah great to work with with those with him uh, and with Studio Historia and a few other figures in there painted by me, which look embarrassingly bad by comparison. But tough luck. Nobody else has got figures for the Assam rifles. So um, uh, there we go. Um, right. Uh, oh, Paul asked an interesting question, actually. He said, you seem to be one of those rare people who's made a business out of your hobby and managed to find a balance where you have a successful business and yet still love the hobby despite us crazy fans being so demanding. Is there a secret to that? Or is that your personality? What, insane? You manage not to feel so much pressure from us at, at, that it, it affects your love of the hobby. Well, um, I think one of the things that helps is I am a bit of a workaholic and I love work and I've always enjoyed work. Um, even when I haven't been doing this, I... I like to get to work for six o'clock in the morning it doesn't bother me if i keep working till 10 o'clock in the evening um uh but i i'm i kind of have a flexible approach to work if i want to stop and go to the pub or if i want to stop and go out for lunch with a friend or if i want to stop and go to the shops i'll just do it whenever i want so i kind of work until i get fed up with it and then don't do it i, I am essentially a selfish person which means that no matter how much people shout and scream at me i i i manage in the end to completely ignore you um but it, it i do sometimes feel under pressure I, I i was feeling last year i had a terrible year with um, <clears throat> trying to get General Dame, the Far East Handbook, and Midgard together all at the same time. And it was just insane. And I was also going out an awful lot of Lardy Games days. And um, <clears throat> by the time you go away for a Lardy Games day, a long way away, you've actually spent four days. Rather, it's not just the one day of the Games day, uh, because you're travelling there, then you're there, then you're travelling back, and then you've got three days' worth of orders to catch up on and emails and so on and so forth and that so four days and that's 
kind of a working week. So I realise that I need to focus more on, whilst it's nice, hopefully, whilst it's nice for 30 people to see me uh, and go on the piss with me on the game stay in, I, I don't know, wherever, um, that's 30 people. What I need to be focusing on is the three, five, six thousand people who want some more products. And that's what I've been singularly failing to do. Casper Olsen says, Studio Historia are top quality and very nice people. They are tremendously nice people. I have been an absolute pain in the arse saying, I'm sorry, can you retake that photo? I'm sorry, can you let me have that in a different format? And I felt absolutely terrible about it. But they have been so kind um, in, in jumping through hoops for me. Um, but, yeah, so, Paul, it, it, uh, I do love my hobby. It's really good. And the fact that I am a, a, a bit of a workaholic does does help. But it, it what's also nice is that unlike, I don't know, a, a shoemaker who stands there making shoes all day or a painter and decorator who paints walls all day, my job is tremendously varied. So today I've been painting figures. I've had a, had a meeting about uh, design. I've been um, designing a logo for Paint and Chat, which YouTube wouldn't let me load up for some reason. But um, I've been to the post office. I've been stuffing envelopes. Uh, it's it's very varied, so it doesn't. I don't find it boring, um, and I I I enjoy it. Um, and you know, we had a couple of people who've, who've had you know water damage products. Uh, sets of rules that have arrived. And that takes a bit of time talking to them, sorting that out. But I'm happy to do that because I want people to get a really good quality product, which is good. Hi, uh, Richard Schwab from Virginia Beach. Talking of damp rule books, Andy Rawson says, when will the War Games rule market become saturated? See what I did there. Um, I don't know. Is it saturated? Um I, I like to think that whilst people are going to produce rule sets that are different and groundbreaking, it doesn't become saturated because the 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 whole canon of what's gone before actually hasn't gone before. It doesn't really exist, does it? You know, no. Is anybody playing sets of rules from 1974 anymore? They exist, but I don't think anybody's playing them. Um, I think that what happens is. Rule sets are like cars. You know, you think you've got your Ford Cortina and you think you've got a great car and then they bring out the Mondeo and so you want that. And it's a little bit better and it's got, got air conditioning and it's whatever. Uh, and I think rule sets are like that. It, it's, it's like a market where things evolve. And so I don't think the War Games rule market will ever become saturated. I think there are some changes happening. I certainly see a lot more emphasis on the new and the shiny uh, than they used to be. I certainly see people um, <clears throat> responding more to, oh, a new, new rule set has come out, uh, therefore we've got to be buying that and we've got to be playing that, and then maybe there won't be, maybe they won't be playing that in nine months' time. So I think to a degree, I've, I've used this analogy before, but I can't remember where, um, you know, rule sets are becoming a bit more like hit singles. It's a bit like the Birdie song, or um, um, you you buy you buy a single and you play it to death for two months, and then you never listen to it again. As opposed to, you know, some of the classics, Dark Side of the Moon or some hippie shite like that, which <coughs> people are still listening to today. And I don't think rule sets. I don't think there are many rule sets that equate to those um, uh, classic albums. I think there are a lot more rule sets out there that are smash hit singles for a, a much briefer period of time. And that's something I try and avoid, to be honest. But I do think that the, the demand um, <coughs> from the gamers out there, gamers are starting to expect to play a new set of rules intensely for a short period of time and then go on to play something else. And I don't know. I might be wrong in that, but it's just a feeling that I have. <coughs> um, 
Mervyn Scott's Oat says, what historical event or battle would you like to see a film made of? I would be the director, so obviously I could govern the historical accuracy. Um, I don't actually watch a lot of films, um, if I'm honest. I don't watch a lot of television. I tend to be work. I just tend to work. Um, what would I like to see a film made of? I'd love to see... Uh, well, it's very topical for me at the moment. I'd love to see a film made about the 14th Army. Uh, I'd love to see a film made about the Chindits. I'd love to see a film made about um, the battle for Mectila. Uh, whether, I mean, the chances of that are infinitesimally small. But, um, yeah, it, it's... Um, when we do see war films, Second World War films, they tend to have a certain historical slant. They tend to be um, <clears throat> looking at, at Normandy in particular or, or the war in Europe. Um, and obviously Hollywood is the home of cinema and consequently they tend to be focusing on uh, the exploits of um, US forces, which is fully understandable and I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, so the chances of them doing something about um, the Far East doesn't seem very likely to me. But if I was a director, yeah, I'd like to see if um, I'd like to see a film showing about Slim's masterstroke, the rapid advance from the Irrawaddy to Mactila, the formation of the boxes, and the Japanese then dashing themselves onto those defensive boxes. I think that, that could be really good. John Wise says, do a lot of games continue uh, coming up with new scenarios? It is an interesting one, isn't it? So the Far East Handbook has got four new scenarios which are very specific to the Far East situation. Um, the um, <coughs> Pacific Handbook will, will have similar. Um, the thing about Chain of Command is the six scenarios that are in there are designed to represent six very distinct phases of battle from, you know, initial patrols through to breakthrough, attack, breakthrough, pursuit, um, and final seizure of an objective. So I, I struggle a little bit because those scenarios were designed to be pretty comprehensive in their own right. You can really um, take any scenario and, and fit it into that. But um, there there is a demand for... Uh, new scenarios, but I, 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 I'm not sure whether you mean generic scenarios, which are, you know, one side attacks and one side defends, or whether you're talking about things like, right, okay, you, you, Andy Shaw says, I think the sign of a good game is how it's supported beyond its initial retreat. So it could well be that we're talking about things like pint-sized campaigns, which are hugely uh, popular. People really like pint-sized campaigns. I think there's, it's a, it's got the two strings to that bow. A, they cost they cost the same as a pint, or at least a pint in in my local, um, which is always attractive because you are getting something for actually not a lot of cost. Um, and uh, evening Yorkshire Dragoon, nice to see you here. Um, and I think people like it because um, uh, it obviously presents a whole new chapter that they can game with. I personally think pint size campaigns are more interesting than just standalone scenarios. But I know a lot of people like standalone scenarios because you can you can cover some very, very specific actions that are unrelated in that way. We've actually got three pint size campaigns um, being planned and in the process of being produced uh, for the Far East. One of them, I guess this is like films, isn't it? Um, I should make the pint size campaign. If I can't get the film, I make the pint size campaign. Um, we're doing one, which is the defence of the Jitra Line in northern Malaya in 19, uh, December 1941, um, which is Britain at its worst. Um, we are doing um, one on the Chindits uh, at White City, uh, which is a really interesting one. And we're doing one on the breakout, the 14th Army's own Blitzkrieg, the breakout after Mactila and the advance south towards Rangoon, uh, racing against the clock to get to Rangoon before the monsoon season uh, interrupts play, rain stops play. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot coming through with that, which is, I'm pleased with that. 
so yeah, uh, I should, uh, Mervin, thanks for your question. I should treat um, <clears throat> scenarios like films. Chris Clark says, do you or Nick see yourself purchasing a 3D, a, a 3D printer? A 3D, <laughs> I've not had a drink, honest. A 3D printer in the near future. And the answer is no. Funnily enough, we, we have talked about this, uh, not getting one, but how we're not going to get one. Uh, basically, <clears throat> um, look, oh, let me show you this. I don't know if you can see that. Do you know what that is? Anybody want to guess what it is? That is an MP's duck house. That is Sir Sidney Roundwood MP's duck house, which Paul at Sabotage designed and printed for me. And um, <clears throat> I can get whatever I want in 3D print from Paul at Sabotage, and I don't have to have a big smelly machine that needs cleaning and this, that, and the other. I break airbrushes after I've used them twice. There is no chance of me having a 3D printer and not breaking it. Hello, Jeremy in Belfast. Nice to uh, nice to hear from you. Nice to see you joining us from uh, across the uh, St. George's Strait, the channel, whatever it's called. Um, right. Um, so, no, and I know Nick feels the same way. Nick constantly moans about lack of space for storage and then buys more stuff. So I, I think there might be a TARDIS effect going on here, but... Um, it's uh, not something that we're... Leslie says 3D printing is another hobby, and I think he has nailed it there. People I know who've got into 3D printing have gone bonkers for it, and it, I can see why. Anything you want, you can have it. It is. Nick calls Paul his genie, and he is a genie because you can have anything you want. But you don't have three wishes. You've got as many as you like. So why wouldn't you keep printing more shite out that you don't really need so i think um neither of us are going to do it and I, and I think i think i'm really comfortable with not doing it if i can get sir sydney roundwood's duck house for a scenario at um hearts of love then that's good enough for me uh, glenn thorstein says with a massive popularity of board games in recent years have you ever had any ideas for developing one i have actually um only vaguely, though, uh, and but what I mean by that is that I have fancied the idea of developing a board game because the board games market is seemingly full of brilliant new ideas, and the people who play board, board games go, this is a brilliant new idea. I love it. I absolutely, well, I'm not sure they will talk about that, but, but they... <laughs> They, they're very welcoming of brilliant new ideas. Where it's interesting, when we produce some rule sets, which maybe just have a few new ideas in, it's, it's sometimes hugely disheartening to see people say, I hate this. And what they hate about it is that they, it isn't what they're familiar with. And the, the historical figure gaming market tends to be very small, so you conservative in that respect. And I sometimes I find that quite depressing. I'm not really, I'm not the type of person who gets depressed, but actually, you know, all that mental health stuff, I'm kind of a genera generation that says, look, if you've got a mental health issue, open another bottle. But actually, it, it isn't true. There are times when I find myself getting really... Um, down in the dumps about things, the black dog arrives, and and actually opening another bottle is often the worst thing to do. Um, uh, and and it, it can be disheartening. And I often look across the fence, and of course, the, you know, the grass is always greener, at the world of board gaming and think, wouldn't it be nice if people said, I really love the fact this has got fabulous new ideas in it, instead of, oh, it's not what I'm used to, so I don't like it. So, uh, yeah, I've, thought about, I've never actually got as far as actually doing anything about it or actually even deciding what the board game would be. Um, Nick developed a really interesting card game based on Bag the Hun, which was fabulous, and I keep telling him we ought to publish it, but he's not done anything about it, but he's too busy eating pies. Um, all right. Um, friends of General Haig, don't be vague, ask for General Haig, says he's always fascinated when you dive into a new period, can you explain the method of how you get deeper into a period before you start the rules bit? 
when you're trying to understand how fighting happened, how command worked, and what was important. Oh, well, I, I, I read books. Um, that's about it, really. Um, uh, when, when I'm first looking at a period to see if I'm interested in it, um, I might read a novel, um, uh, one that's sort of been well-liked and reviewed. I might. I will very definitely be listening to some books on Audible. Um, once I kind of get to the stage where I think I, I know I want to do this, it, I tend to shift more towards sort of academic tomes, even like academic papers. Um, I'm a member of a number of uh, these things online where you get access to uh, university papers and, uh, uh, and and that's brilliant. I mean, you, you can really get some unusual stuff there. Um, but it, it's... At the, at the outset, I tried to, to take it quite casually where I just... Um, do I consider memoirs of individuals? Yeah, I love memoirs of individuals. Uh, I've just picked up a couple, actually. Let me, hold on. Let me show you this one, which happens to be here. Um, oh, the other one's up by my bed, which I haven't got. But I managed to pick this one up. Ken Cooper's A Platoon's Epic Fight in the Burma Campaign. Things like that. Absolutely, absolutely key and essential um, to get small detail that you don't get from, from uh, historians normally. You will... Sometimes you'll pick it up on um, uh, some of the in-depth papers that people write for their thesis masters or whatever. Um, but uh, rock and roll, Dave, Dave, Dave Brown, housewife's favourite, is in the house. Good evening, David. Uh, welcome. Uh, at 85 people online, how many are housewives? I have no idea, but I'm sure they're all here for you, not me. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 there's, there's all sorts of different levels that you really need to read at to understand fully what's going on. Um, I do like to read big picture books, not pictures, big picture as in the books that explain the whole, um, vista of what is happening so I can understand the political background, um, what's going on. And then, uh, uh, you you have to delve in and go in and get a lot of detail. And I, I actually spend a lot of money on buying out-of-print books that are first-hand accounts. Um, obviously, we're now at it, the Battle of Kohima started 80 years ago yesterday, which would have been a great day to, to launch if it wasn't for the financial year. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving away from a point where the books that used to be in the library when I was at school, uh, focusing on the exploits of people who'd served in World War II, are not as popular as not as popular as they were. I mean, I certainly, I'd never forget going into the uh, local library near here on the 50th anniversary of um, Arnhem, and they had a copy of John Frost's book on sale for one pound um and it was the last copy in the whole of the county and i said to them you do realize what happened 50 years ago today and you're selling this book for a pound and you don't have it anywhere else in the county and you think okay well lots of books on lentils knitting lentil eating knitting lesbians whatever all sorts of trendy stuff that that's great and we need that, but it's sad that we seem to be shipping out a lot of the stuff on military history that used to be bread and butter. I think it's a change on the way history is being taught. It's a lot more about social history than political history now. Um, but there we go. You need to find a library that's open first. Yes, you do, says Rich M. And the library that I'm talking about is now shut. <clears throat> is using lingo from the period important or not so much so? Depends how you want to do it, really. Um, I think I probably speak the lingo of the period anyway. My dad served in World War II. I was only born 18 years after it ended. So I think that um, I was very much brought up in that world where that was the wallpaper of our lives. Everybody we knew, you know, all the grown-ups we knew had served in the war and, you know... Um, is it important to is it important to avoid the lingo of the period is possibly 
uh, more of a pertinent question. You know, should we abbreviate the word Japanese? I don't have a problem with it. But then again, my uncle was a prisoner on the Burma Railway, so I don't. <laughs> I have a very different perspective on that than somebody who's at school now. Would I abbreviate the word Japanese in the Far East Handbook? No, it's not necessary. Um, <clears throat> but would I refer to an abbreviated? version of Japanese when I'm talking to somebody? Yes, I would, because it doesn't trouble me at all. But, that, you know, there are other terms that I wouldn't, of the period, that I wouldn't use. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I don't think that's unusual. I think that's just, you know, everything evolves, language evolves in the same way that rule sets evolve. Um, talking of which, Colin in Devon, uh, <clears throat> originally from uh, Scotland, says, if you were hired to rewrite the national curriculum for history, what would you focus on? And why? <clears throat> I'm not really sure whether to answer that one, and maybe I will later, because it's 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 got potential to be political, and I try and avoid political unless I'm tweeting about the Pope. Um, but, um, uh, uh, yeah, I try and avoid that one. Alex in Rochdale says, how do you deal with cyber bullies? Well, that is an issue. I tend to rough them up in the playground, steal their dinner money, and give them a Chinese burn. A Tom in Ireland said, should we replace the D6 with the D10 as the standard dice in wargaming rules? It's very interesting. Tom's actually been deployed uh, away with the United Nations for a year, and I think they must have been feeding him mind-bending drugs. Uh, because the idea of replacing the D6 with the D10 is, I think, totally bonkers. The idea of a dice in a war game is that it allows you to determine an outcome and there's – no, not definitely not the D8. D8 should be put in a giant crushing machine and destroyed. D6 or die. Uh, there's a joke in there. I love it. Um, and um, uh, how many outcomes are you going to have to any situation? Well, if it's going to be a straight line linear selection of outcomes where every potential outcome is as likely as the other, well, six probably covers all your bases, doesn't it? And if you've got more outcome, potential outcomes than six, you'll probably find that they are weighted. Some outcomes are more likely than others, in which case you've got 2D6 or 3D6 and you get a lovely bell curve, which allows you to determine that. The D6 is a thing of beauty. A D10 really is something that was designed to be a suppository that somebody accidentally got their hands on and put numbers on it. So definitely not Tom. And I hope sanity returns to you in the Republic of Ireland very soon. Um, um, <clears throat> oh, Christian says, D100, no. Christian uh, in the United States of America says, what is Rich most excited for at Historicon? Um, well, bear in mind that you're talking to the person who famously states that I don't like war game shows. <laughs> the idea of spending four days at a war game show fills me with utter dread and i realize that um i realize that that is um probably uh, the wrong thing to say but what i'm really looking forward to at um historicon is is seeing people and having a laugh with people and i think that <clears throat> um i will probably do that in the hours of the day where I'm not doing things that I've been scheduled to do. It would be nice to pick up a game of In the Buff and just play it, even though it's not on my agenda. Uh, HMGS want me to run sharp practice in the foyer with the bloke who played Rifleman something in the sh sharp programs, Rifleman, God knows what, which strikes me as just two old farts standing there playing a game. Uh, whatever okay if that's what you want me to do that's fine um but the bit i'm most looking forward to is just having a laugh with harris yeah not rolf rifleman it begins with an r um but yeah so i'm really just looking forward to catching up with people meeting people uh, for the first time who we've known online for years and seeing old friends because you know that this is I don't know, my fourth time at Historicon, I can't remember. Um, and um, Jason Sulky, yeah, who apparently is smashing chat 
So um, it will be um, nice to see him. Red Miss said he's looking forward to meeting me and hopes to get in on one of my games. Well, hopefully you can. I just um, <clears throat> let's keep our fingers crossed. The, um, <clears throat> the 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 system they have there is is an an enigma within a something or other to me, and it's all a little bit um, um, confusing that you have to book things. I, I rather like the more anarchic approach in the UK, where you just turn up and go, "Can I jump on board?" and you do. Um, but uh, and then people after ten minutes with me, people tend to say, "Can I leave?" and they do. <laughs> but there we are. So it'll be great. It'll be great to go over there and see all those people. What force list will be included? Oh, we've done that one, Michael, haven't we? Yeah, we've talked about the, that. And um, what are the chances, says Jeffrey Smith, of a two fat lardis game set in a sci-fi or fantasy or Arthurian background? Well. We've Red Mist said we're Americans and we make everything complicated. You do seem to do so, but it is. I understand the difference is that if I'm running a game at Salute or I'm running a game at any of the UK conventions, it's a one day event. I've got the table for the whole day in America. You're hot betting the table is one minute I could be running a game on the table, the next minute somebody else could be running a game on the table. So they do have to book you in, which I can understand why. Um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, so uh, we have done an Arthurian game, which is Dux Britanniarum, which is really all about the age of Arthur. I saw a historian saying there's not a lot of history in this. No, it's a game set in the mythical world of King Arthur. Okay. Um, uh, sci-fi and fantasy. Well, I did write a sort of sci-fi campaign background, and I was looking looking at doing something with it. And there were some lovely figures by First Call that I had painted up, and it kind of went by the wayside, really. It was a shame because I had a really plausible situation set in a colony on <clears throat> a mining colony out in deep space, and contact with Earth ceased. Nobody knew what was happening. Nobody, The world could have blown up. Who knows? But it means that the three main power blocks in the world, uh, one of which amusingly is Europe run by Britain, uh, tongue in cheek, um, was um, were, suddenly find themselves competing um, for resources, which of course is what war is always about. It's about resources. Can your tribe get access to the water as opposed to that tribe? Can your can your nation get access to the mineral wealth of one country rather than another nation? So it became a war for resources, which I really like the idea of doing, but in the end I just realised I can't turn on the microwave effectively, let alone write a set of sci-fi rules. Um, um, <clears throat> Scott Miller says a general question regarding status of releases for the Far East, Pacific, Market Garden, Chain of Command books. Well, Far East is coming very soon. Pacific is in the queue after that because there's some issues that I just need to finish a bit of research on. Um, <clears throat> Market Garden should be following on straight after the Far East. Um, that's uh, on my desk for editing. Um, any hints of what to expect in those books and what might be different from the current rules? For example, do the Japanese have underground tunnels a movement to consider. They do in the Pacific Handbook. They don't in the Far East Handbook. Let's have a look. I've got it open here because I've been working on it today. Let's, let's have a look what what we've got. So you're going to have Japanese ruses. Japanese very good at sending out things like jitter parties to um, <clears throat> discombobulate their opponents. So we're going to be seeing a lot of things like that. Far East terrain rules is a big thing. Terrain in the Far East is very different to the terrain in Europe. And it's very varied. So there's a pretty large section there describing what different sorts of terrain you're going to come across. And you look at it and you think, bloody hell, this is complicated. Hold on. But actually it's not because you're never going to have all of those terrain types on the table at any point in time. You know, you've, you've got tropical swamps, you've got banana plantations, you've got primary jungle, you've got secondary jungle, you've got bamboo, you've got kunai grass. You've got paddy fields, all sorts of things. But, you know, you're going to have a table where there's probably two or three, maybe four at the most, different types of terrain on it. So it's easily done. But that's going to be a large section of the rules explaining how to deal with that. 
um, uh, we're going to look at um, lesser types of structures. So village huts, for example. Um, you know, when when we're looking at the main rules and we're looking at buildings collapsing, we're looking at buildings made of bricks and mortar. You've got to have slightly different variation on the rules for village huts, how the huts burn compared to normal bricks and mortar houses. What happens in the monsoon season? Bits and pieces like that. So that's going to be uh, important. But you've also got jungle craft, how troops behave in the jungle, or more to the point, how a training jungle training or experience or lack of it makes them think uh, and and how they work so there are some rules in there where we um <clears throat> basically rate troops according to their level of comfort in the uh jungle leslie so that's what you can expect there things like amphibious landing that's going to be covered in the pacific in much more detail things like caves things like tunnels that's going to be covered in the pacific it's all written um but uh, there we are um let's <laughs> thank you yorkshire dragoon for that very witty comment but let's not um hooray for secret underground tunnel movement is that something you're keen on scott do you do a lot of that um right okay um more fifth column. Yeah, yeah, you've got um, you've got all sorts of dodgy friends. I mean, there are serious issues about um, uh, in Hong Kong, for example, about the uh, Japanese being led by uh, treacherous uh, Chinese who opposed Chiang Kai-shek and were supporting uh, the other side, uh, the the other factions within the Chinese um, po politics who were in favour of coming to some arrangement with the japanese um you're gonna have um <clears throat> oh daring dare hello mate i was only wondering about you i've not heard from you for a while nice to um nice to hear from you nice to see you there down in sydney in new south wales um uh will you ever return to stalingrad says casper yes i will yeah very keen to go there leslie says has bonsai bonkers slipped from the schedule no um, Bonsai Bonkers is very much on there, being play tested, um, as is Flashing Blades. We're very much looking forward uh, to getting that, but it, I'm still clearing this log jam. It is happening, and the log jam is clearing, and things are moving in the right directions. But yeah, it's just, I've got to get it out of the way just for my own mental health because it's been driving me up the bloody wall. Um, Christian, hi. Um, it's my pleasure. Always happy to answer questions. Um, um is there any plans for sharp practice three says colin down in Cornwall. colin i hope you're feeling better mate i know you had an operation on on um something or other was it removing one of your six toes i know what you got down like, like in Cornwall. um is there any um third version of sharp practice no probably not um probably maybe one day but no uh Thomas Chase says the pursuit of the oil fields on the southern front of the eastern front is more interesting. I tend to find the, the southern front of the eastern front m more interesting anyway. I, I'm particularly interested in Romanians fighting in Odessa, which I think is a really interesting um, <clears throat> action. Uh, the clearing of the Crimea by Manstein is really fast moving and interesting. Um, uh, you know, the fighting in the Cuban is really famous for the Cross of Iron. And that's interesting because it's in a lot of trench warfare, as, as those who've seen the film will recall. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think the further north you go, the more tedious it gets. The fighting around Leningrad tends to be really, really static. Um, you do get some slightly interesting troops up there, like the Spanish Blue Division, who are always fun. Um, but um, I don't think they found it fun, but... <laughs> Um, but um, things like the Slovak Fast Division, the Hungarians, all those really crazy dudes are, um, are down south, which is, uh, and it's a bit warmer there. Uh, you can put your thermals away. Um, so have I slipped away from a question? Um, what? Um, yeah, so lots of different, lots of new things in the Far East Hamburg, and there will be even more in the Pacific. Um, Oh, another question on the same similar vein, actually. David Smiley says, in the forthcoming Far East Supplement for Chain of Command, will there be additional rules for the occupation of bunkers? 
and machine gun positions, etc., commonly used extensively by the Japanese, as the patrol phase might be difficult to simulate the crewing and occupation of fixed defences, or how best to simulate the manning of such defences in the cock existing rules. Well, yeah, that, there's a whole there's a whole lot on the Japanese use of bunkers and the way Japanese deploy with bunkers. So there's a whole <clears throat> section of new types of fortifications. Um, intriguingly. Um, Intriguingly, uh, how you build your defences is going to be down to you. Um, you've got your jump-off points. How you place your bunkers and how you create interlocking, mutually supporting fields of fire um, is going to be down to you. You get a, chance, a choice of where you deploy them. How effectively you do that will depend how effectively um, the, what, what result you get. Have you considered a Crete supplement for Jane and Kamal? Jack, lad, have I? Yes, I'm actually going to Crete again in June. It's my third time there. The first time I went there, I was reading about the Kokoda Trail in Australia. The last time I went there, I was reading about fighting in Burma. I'm hoping, with the Far East Handbook out of the way, this time I might get to read about the fighting on Crete, which would be a bit more appropriate. So, yeah, I'm really, I'm very close to Malema Airfield, um, uh, very overlooking to Dubai. Um, so it will be great. How do you price support options? I do it in old money. I still think in pounds, shillings, and pence. Um, uh, you would expect to see Crete to be part of the North Africa and Desert War. Yeah, it would, but there will be some separate pint-sized campaigns in there. Am I going on too much? I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, um, um, how long? I've been doing this for nearly an hour and a half. I hope I'm not boring you. I'm still going through the questions. But we're nearly there. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. So you'll get rid of me very soon. And uh, welcome on board, um, uh, James, who's just doing the washing up. Nine, nine, you're the 95th person. With how is your Midgard force coming on? Brilliantly. I've just got to add. I'm just looking for a unit of kind of um, low grade caravan. Uh, workers who who have to fight and i've just seen today gripping beast have just posted some pictures of um war at some war of the roses billman that look absolutely the dog's bits so i think i'm going to get them because he's been finding the right one check your leader tv said good morning rich scott of course completely mad thinking it's morning when obviously it's evening even if in your if you're in australia it's still evening because time lives in Greenwich. So uh, good evening, Scott. Nice to hear from you. I've enjoyed your films, by the way, on GDA. They're really good. And thank you for a fabulous um, review uh, that you did of the rules. As I, I think that um, you're absolutely right. They are a really, really great set of rules, and Dave has done a brilliant job with them, and I think they are going to be the benchmark uh, for Napoleonic Worlds. Uh, rules going forward so brilliant um <laughs> uh yeah yorkshire dragoon is also saying he's enjoying your gda stuff which is i think universally true you're doing a great great job there uh mhp montfroy in the netherlands not hmp montfroy um and obviously my dutch pronunciation is atrocious um so uh let's see what else we've got on the shopping list these things always last about, it's like the odd cast. They always last an hour and 20 minutes, which I think is all about my attention span. Um, Fidelis uh, says, hey, Richard, recently discovered I ain't been shot. I'm really loving it too. Thank you. I'm glad you are. It's, uh, I, I think it stood the test of time for a set of rules that's 20-odd years old. I'm really glad you're enjoying it. Maraviglia in Sheffield said, <clears throat> you have free reign to create any game you want and there will be an audience for it. What is it, and why is it Hello Sailor? I love that. That's really funny. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I, If I want to create a game, I tend to do it. Um, so uh, there we are. Our, Thomas Chase says, our minds can only absorb as much as our bums can endure. That's a lifestyle comment, mate. Um, right. Um <clears throat> John Dillon says, talking of Iron Man Shot Mum, he says, I remember reading an example of play, I believe, in the first edition of Iron Man Shot Mum rulebook. I found my imagination drawn into the historical world of British sections slipping through a 1944 
Normandy orchard while the area was secretly surveyed by a hidden MG42 aloft in the top window of a French farmhouse. With the increase in popularity of tabletop RPGs, could you envisage a successful tabletop RPG set in World War II or some form of game that would be based on members of a single section or squad? Well, I can, and it's called Go Commando, and myself and the fat lad are working on it. And, um, yeah, we're having some interesting fun with that. So, definitely, it's not something I, I used to think would be any really interest me. But I um, I have found the process really interesting, and we're, we're looking at that. It, it has to be – you can't just make it a, an extension of Chain of Command. It's got to be very, very different. So, um, uh, we'll we'll see where we go with that. Somebody asked me a question talking of Nicholas. Somebody said, how's Nick? I haven't seen him much recently. Well, I haven't buried him in the garden, if that's what you're asking. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's very well. So, in fact, this very evening, he set sail for Normandy. He is going to be in Normandy for the next three or four days, looking over the... Uh, the um, looking over the, the battlefields there. He's, I know he's starting at Pegasus Bridge and working his way all the way across. My garden isn't that big. It is, actually. But, <laughs> but it's not that wide. But, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Jim says that's precisely what someone who had buried him in the garden would say. Honestly, I don't have the energy for digging a big enough hole. But, yeah, so he's off to Normandy. And if you if you follow him on Twitter, Dozy Bugger on Twitter, You'll see him tweeting from Normandy. And you know I'm not in Normandy because I'm the one who does all the bloody work. So I'm sat here in the office. Um, okay. I've got one question left, and it was the one that I was avoiding because it, it's slightly on the edge of politics, and I don't really like politics. I don't like politicians, and I don't like to get involved in politics, really. But Colin in Devon said you're hired to rewrite the national curriculum for history. So what do you focus on and why? I think, and it may not, let's start again. When I was a kid at school, we learned about Waterloo, we learned about Nelson. We, Britain began when the Romans arrived. And we learned about all the kings and queens, we learned about the Tudors, but we also learned about the Plantagenets, and we also learned about the Stuarts. And, and actually, when we were taught history, it began with the Romans and then carried on all the way through up to, I guess, certainly the 20th century at that time. And um, we were taught a version of history that was largely ha hagiographical in terms of it, it was the history of Great Britain and telling us why we were great. And that tends to have gone a little bit out of fashion now. I think in any society, you need some kind of mortar to bind together the bricks of that society. And I would like to see, I understand that, um, I understand that the world has moved on and that the way we study, study history is now based more on social history than political history. But I think there's a huge amount in what is a very rich history that we can talk about that emphasizes the positive experience of the people who live here, whatever their race or creed or color. And I feel that we need to have to talk more about what makes us one rather than what divides us. And it troubles me when I look at social media to see just how divisive politics is and that's one of the reasons I don't like it so I would love to see a national curriculum that focused on how the Royal Navy played a major role in ending slavery how Britain played a major role in ending fascism and national socialism and I think we have a lot to celebrate in our shared history and I'd like to talk about how people from different parts of the Commonwealth and Empire as was played their hugely important role in doing that and how much that we owe them for what they've done and uh i think it that is as much as i want to say on the subject um but i would say <clears throat> that i'd like to see people learning about history from the earliest times and 
through to modern times, as opposed to Romans, Tudors, Hitler, which are disconnected and frankly have no context. My daughter has got a first class degree in history from York, which has got a first class reputation for teaching history, and she's never heard of the Plantagenets. I left school at 15 and I can name every Plantagenet monarch. It's not very difficult, actually, but um, <coughs> in fact, I could probably name almost every monarch because that's the way we were taught. And I, I, I just think that what that gives me is a greater appreciation of context. Even if the even if the 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 study has to be superficial in some respects, by having that understanding of the continuous story rather than simply dipping in at what people think are sexy points and why they think Henry VIII is a sexy point, I haven't got a clue. Perhaps Nick might disagree, um, but yeah. So that's that's all I'd like to say. I think um, I think we should we should celebrate what we've done. That's really good, and and for me what the Royal Navy did. I did some research into an admiral who, we have a road in our village called Admiral's Close, and I did some research into it, and that guy was involved in, in uh, helping to end the slave trade in East Africa, and he was wounded on his first uh, fight with the enemy in the 1840s against Arab slave, slavers there, and, and the, they freed a whole boatload of slaves, and I just think that's something that we we were on the side of the angels then, as we were when we when we defeated fascism. And I think that those those are two things in the on the the balance book of life that we should be celebrating. So there we go. Um, um, Thomas Chase said, "How about the Kazarian Empire? If not, ask why." Well, you know, th there is a limit to how much you can teach. Um, and I think people need to understand the context of what their own country has done and how their own country's dealing with other people has had impact. And I think we need to, um, I think we need to um, uh, rethink the way that we we teach some of this stuff. But that's there we go. It's political, isn't it? I don't really want to go down that route because uh, I, I I try and avoid the subject. But there's an honest answer. Um, and that is the end of all the questions, unless there are any other. Let me just flick through it. No, thank God. I wasn't going to answer that question, and in a way I wish I hadn't, because somebody's going to say, you're a rabid old fart, and I'm not, but um, but I'm old. There you go. You will be one day. Um, check your leader TV said politics has become dangerous ground. It has, mate. It has, and best that we avoid it in many ways. The great thing about wargaming is that um, we are brought together with people who come from disparate backgrounds, who come from different social classes, different educational backgrounds, different races, different colours, different sexes, different genders, and we share our love of our hobby. And that is a fabulous a leveler and i think that's one of the most positive things about what we have in the world of historical wargaming when i go on twitter and stray off the world of historical wargaming i find myself facing up to monsters and demons that i would rather have nothing to do with we are very very fortunate and to a degree i fear that that is because we have our heads buried in the sand but what do I care? I'm too bloody old. I can't influence, can't change the world now. So um, uh, I'm just going to get on and enjoy myself. There we go. Um, uh, Thomas Chase says, it's the reason I only play skirmish because every man matters. I think that's a really, really uh, good point. And that's one of the reasons that I enjoy playing skirmish games because, um, and one of the reasons why when we put together a lot of pint-sized campaigns, we put the emphasis on thinking about the people who are within your platoon, thinking about the way they think about you when they're going to frag their officer. <laughs> um, but I think it's important. It gives you context. Um, and, you know, when, when, um, when I was doing my O-levels at school, I was able to interview a lot of people who were present at uh, Dunkirk and the fall of France in 1940. And those people... Um, were tremendously helpful and informative. I, I worked, I was embarrassingly, when I was 19 years old, I was the boss of a bloke 
who'd been a sergeant at Dunkirk, fought his way up the leg of Italy through North Africa. And it was just a farcical that I was his boss. But these were real people. And it's, I think it's important to me that when we're playing games, we we respect them. I listened to an interesting podcast um, the other day, which was saying, why is historical wargaming so contentious? And um, apparently this is stimulated by the fact that uh, a lot of people in the world of fantasy wargaming are saying, you historical people are morbid because you're killing real people. We're not. We're killing pixies and elves and whatever. And I just think it's a load of cobblers. Um, you are c celebrating mass slaughter without any moral compass to guide you, whereas in the world of historical wargaming, I like to think that when we read our history books, we do consider the people we're reading about, and when we when we reproduce that on the tabletop, we do exactly the same. And I think having that anchor um, serves us much better. Um, and uh, uh, I I was saddened to hear that podcast. I felt the guys who did it did a, a tough job in addressing a tough question. It's not one I think I'd bother to rehearse, but there we are. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there we go. Any other questions? Should be part of an officer. Cock should be part of uh, uh, of officer training. Well, you got plenty of, and oh, no, I'm not going there. Um, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, why not, Scott? I I've known people. I, funnily enough, when the British Army were deploying into Afghanistan, I knew some um, company commanders who were running games of chain of command for their junior officers, just to give them some kind of exposure to think about the decisions you're going to be making a long time ago now, but it was probably when, when they first came out. Um, I think any wargaming should be on the curriculum for um, people in the military. I have very strong feelings that playing historical wargaming, not set in the modern time, actually pr provides you with an opportunity to um, consider... Uh, warfare without having to put it in the context of what you could be doing next week. In fact, I know that when the British Army war games, they tend to say, right, we're going to deploy to Estonia, so let's do a war game based on Estonia. Don't do that. Do the American Civil War. Do uh, ancient Rome. Do something different because it takes you outside your comfort zone, but you're still exploring the basic principles of warfare. Um, and modern militaries miss a trick completely, but I personally feel that modern militaries miss a trick with wargaming almost completely um, to the extent that I really can't be bothered to get involved with them anymore. Any final questions before I sign off? I'm sure I must have bored you all to tears. 93 of you. Thanks for joining me. I, I I've really enjoyed it. I have really not achieved very much with my um, figures, <laughs> but <laughs> but I never do, do I? Um, but the wife's out, so I'm going to go and read my book without having her watching absolute gibberish on television. Um, uh, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing some of you very soon at Hearts of Lard and then at Salute. And then going forward, a whole range of events. Oh, of course, Arnhem for Cloglard. Um, my my school had a great war games club, but I didn't attend it because I was too cool to be associated with toy soldiers. So I focused more on things like beer and rugby. And we didn't have girls at my school, so I didn't focus on anything like that. Um, uh, how's Go Commando coming along? Yeah, good, good, good. I just feel uh, we've we've kind of got the initial phases, uh, which is like the patrol phase together, which has been really good. Personally, I think we need to completely rewrite the way um, the interaction between the different characters. But yeah, good. Jasper is looking forward to Cloglard, aren't we all, Jasper? I'm really looking forward to coming over from Arnhem. We've got a couple of guys from Lard America coming, which will be absolutely brilliant. And we've got Lardis from all over Euroland coming to join us there. So, uh, yeah, absolutely good. I, I'm going to read this book, actually, Leslie. I think I'm going to read this one. I did buy another one at the same time on a guy who served with the six Gurkhas. I think it was the third six Gurkhas, who 
were involved with the Chindits under Lieutenant Colonel Schoon um, at White City. So I might read that one. I don't know. But uh, uh, good, good, good night to you, Scott. It's definitely, um, it's definitely night. It's nine oh nine here, which means it's ten past eight in the morning there, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Have a good one, everybody. Um, right. Uh, I don't know how to get out. <laughs> I've got a new computer and it's all changed. Right. Tot scenes. Cheerio all. Bye-bye.